All right. Well, Eric, welcome back. Thank you're, you. You become the holy day guy. I'm kind of your matters, holiday so. dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for coming back. Advent and Christmas. And you now are. it's Holy Week and Easter. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're excited that you're back in Utah and that you can talk about Holy Week. We're going to focus kind of on the second half of Holy Week and Easter Sunday sure. this time. Um, but I just wanted to tell you, I, you have had a, a, a real influence on our family with this idea of sort of creating ritual around holy time. And that's mm -hmm. been really transformative and has made these holidays meaningful, but also something that sort of you start sensing is getting closer. And and that has just added so much to the holidays, more than, more than I think, uh, the way we had thought a bit about it, like th these are the scriptures that we're going to read together on this special day and we need to have some reverent time on Easter Sunday. It feels more like a season that we have to look forward to. Right. And a lot of this, of course, is just bor borrowed from ancient Christian practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, we have some kind of apostolic mandate for this, right? I mean, Elder Stevenson straight out of the shoot conference last year, an April conference, he said, we need to do more to make April yeah. special. Mm. And, you know, I, I kind of smiled as he was talking because he said, you know, <laughs> like, I looked at thing. all the things we did for Christmas and we don't do enough for Easter yeah. and we should use Christmas as our template to yeah. make the Easter season more significant yeah. and to ramp up. Now, when I visited you last time, we talked about Advent taking the four weeks before Christmas to get ready for it. Yep. With Easter, traditionally, it is the eight days, right? Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday, what is called Holy Week. But actually, some of our Christian friends from the heavily liturgical traditions, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, um, Anglicans, Episcopalians, some Lutherans, they do what you've probably heard of as Lent, mm -hmm. yeah. which is 40 days plus six Sundays. So it's actually 46 days getting ready for Easter. So now we have this kind of, there's a technical term in Roman Catholicism, they used to call it Passion Tide. Mm -hmm. So you've got Passion Week, but Passion Tide is getting ready for Passion Week. So now our family does something those seven days before Palm Sunday, short, and then we're kind of in the mode. And so when it's time for Lazarus Saturday, we have a longer reading. Uh, we mm -hmm. sing songs about the resurrection because Lazarus is raised from the dead is kind of a type of what Jesus will do. We even bake these fun little cinnamon rolls called mm -hmm. Lazarakia. It's a Greek tradition where you have these little cinnamon rolls that you you shape like they're a little shrouded figure, right? So they're little Lazaruses with clothes yeah. fries and we make them and we eat them when they're still warm and it just kind of makes it festive. Yeah. And then Palm Sunday is this great day. And then we read what Jesus taught in the temple on Monday and Tuesday and talk about his prophecy of the second coming from the Mount of Olives. And Wednesday is this beautiful day. And I know we're not going to focus on it today, but <laughs> for those of you who are interested, very short readings uh, from Mark and Matthew parallels this, where the Jewish leaders conspire against Jesus. But then you have this beautiful scene where another woman anoints Jesus. Uh, and then you have Judas agree to betray Jesus. And those two conspiratorial scenes framing this beautiful supper scene with the mm. anointing have given that day its traditional name, which is Spy Wednesday, right? Okay. Judas and the leaders are, are kind mm. of skulking around, spying and planning against Jesus. But the beauty is this woman, and she's not named in Mark and Matthew, knows that Jesus has come to die. The disciples are still in this mode. He's our king. We were just celebrating Palm Sunday. We're shouting Hosanna. But she knows he's come to die. And so she's preparing him for his mm. burial. And what our family does in addition to reading those um, those verses and singing a song that goes lovely with it, um, we go around the room and we talk about women of Christ in our lives who are like mm -hmm. this woman who knew who Jesus was. That's Elaine cool. and I always talk about our mothers and the kids always talk about their mom. And when Sam was little, he talked about his teacher and his helper at school. And, and it's just a wonderful way to kind of yeah. highlight female testimonies. But then we get to what I was hoping we'd talk about today, yeah. which yeah. are the four big days. Yeah, yeah. and we yeah. really want to talk about those. But yeah. if we could back up to sure, one sure. second. On, Sorry, on, you get no, me no, talking no. about no, no, no. Jesus and Easter. I'm I won't actually be just quiet. really curious about Lent in yeah. particular and how, it's, how, to, how it made its way into the litur liturgical calendar. The way I understand it is that it sort of harks back to Jesus's, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Right. So is Jesus, it, took, an, an Jesus took 40 for, days in the wilderness to prepare for his ministry, yep. right? And the three synoptic gospels say he fasted and prayed in that time period. So the idea was for Christians, let us take 40 days to fast and pray to get ready for mm -hmm. the highlight of the Christian year and what the good news of Jesus is all about is suffering, death, yep. and resurrection. It's not 40 straight days. It starts on Ash Wednesday, but traditionally... Every Sunday, the Lord's Day is always a feast day. So you actually don't fast on those days. But you know, I had a good friend, Peter Van Hook, who was the priest in charge here at St. Mary's Episcopal for years and years before he died. And I remember going to his Ash Wednesday service one year and he said, you know, people always talk about what they should give up for Lent because of this idea of fasting. Yeah. 
said, I, th- I want you this year to think about what you can do more of for Lent. Mm. Pray more, read the scriptures more, provide more service, mm-hmm. take care of the poor, heal relationships. So the idea was to spiritually prepare yourself. And in, in the new book that Trevin and Hatch and I came out with last year on the Easter season, we actually added a chapter, which was along this idea of the week ramp up to Holy Week. And we called it the prelude, which is okay. the road to Jerusalem. And then after the Easter Sunday story, which is the empty tomb, the women at the tomb, Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, the 10 disciples, we had another chapter called the postlude because it's not over on Easter Sunday, right? Thomas doesn't see Jesus for another week. Then you've got the story in the Sea of Galilee, but then you have Paul's testimony of Jesus. You've got the Book of Mormon accounts of Jesus. And then you have, um, you know, the Doctrine and Covenants, section 76. Mm-hmm. And so we actually added a chapter. I'm really into music. So we had a pre- prelude and a postlude, right? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> kind of bracketing Holy Week and Easter cool. because it's the ongoing apostolic witness. Yeah. And Elder Stevenson actually mentioned that as you're putting together your own Easter traditions, we've got this wonderful thing called the Book of Mormon, which is another witness. The risen Lord actually taught and did the things and worked miracles that third Nephi tells us about um but it it goes on and on you've got the testimony of living christ we have all kinds of resources in the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints that make the easter story not just something we do once a year but it's ongoing yeah we talked to carrie mulestein a couple of weeks ago and he he said something about how you know easter hasn't really been commercialized yet a little bit but not in the way that christmas has and so we really have this opportunity to decide what we want easter to look like so before we get into specific holy days, I would love for you to just talk about the fun things that you do or did with your kids, especially when they were little, mm-hmm. to sort of, to me, and I, it's not just for kids. I think it, you feel it. You feel like the delight in the air when you do this as an adult too. But what, what kind of things do you do to sort of set the stage in your home for this? Right. I mentioned how, and my children, my daughter's married now. She and her husband are living with us while we're in between our Jerusalem assignments. Our son Samuel is, is with us. But when they were little, we had done our first Jerusalem assignment assignment in 2011 and we celebrated Palm Sunday on the Mount of Olives coming down with palm fronds and everything. So the next year we actually bought, they weren't actually palm fronds, but we went to Michael's Craft or Hobby Lobby or somewhere and got these green something (laughs) branches. And we walked around the park in our neighborhood, waving the palm branches, you know, and, and very rarely will award music chair think to (laughs) <laughs> to program all glory laud and honor on Palm Sunday. Although every ward should, that mm. should be the song on Palm Sunday, all glory laud and honor. I think you look directly I in the camera. So. Now. <laughs> yes. You bishops, ward councils, music chairs, all glory laud and honor, Palm Sunday. And so we sang it at home. We read the account of the triumphal entry and then we waved our branches and walked around the park. And we did that for a couple of years. Awesome. As they got yeah. older, they thought that was a little corny. <laughs> but when we were in Jerusalem this last year, we had a devotional where we talked about in the Jerusalem Center and then all the students and the youth of the district and all the faculty families, we did that Palm Sunday procession wow. again. There's nothing like that. Yeah, I love um, it. But, you know, you say, what's the fun stuff? Um, you know, I mentioned Lazarus Saturday, which is kind yeah. of a pre-Holy Week thing. Whenever you can have good food or treats, yes. that yeah. always gets the kids' it, and attention. And it's multiple senses. It's like yeah, yeah. And, and smells the whole, like Easter. And, you know, when Sam was little, Rachel would always make the cinnamon dough. But, you know, she'd say, now, Sammy, we're going to fold this so it looks like Lazarus in his burial oh. clothes. And, you know, and yeah. he's in the tomb, blah, blah, blah. And so it was kind of like when you dye Easter eggs and say this is yeah. a symbol of the tomb. You as you say, multiple yeah. senses to kind of teach the story in addition to having read about it in the scriptures. Um, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, as I think we'll discuss here, are, are more somber affairs, but we still sometimes do something a little different. You know, we will sometimes have kind of a Mediterranean uh, themed thing. And there's a great book called F- uh, Feast and Foods of Jesus, where you oh. can actually have recipes for the different kinds of foods they probably ate at that That's time. Cool. That's so, you know, awesome. my, my daughter loves to make matzo, or you can just have pita or something, you yeah. know. And so you can kind of have the meal on, on your Last Supper day be yeah. similar to what Jesus did. So you've read the account of the Last Supper, then you're eating something similar. But that somber, because as we'll talk about, I think Latter-day Saints in particular would really want to focus on the Gethsemane experience. Yeah. Um, on Good Friday, our family 
at least the kids and I, I, I don't force these things on Elaine, but um, <laughs> we tend to fast because okay. Jesus was on the cross hungry and thirsty, right? Mm. So we'll fast, but then um, after we go, we when they sometimes we go to the temple in the morning and do baptisms for the dead. Now we go out to um, a place here in Provo, East Lawn Memorial Cemetery. Where oh, it's like my favorite cemetery. But you know where the Easter cross is? Do you know the story no. of the Easter cross? So in 1920s or 30s, there were a couple Provo stakes, the community church, and one other church, it might have been St. Mary's, got together and built this stone cross on Y Mountain where they would have interfaith Good Friday services. Really? really? Well, that kind of fell out in the 50s or 60s and the cross broke down. And some Provo young man decided as his Easter project to rebuild the Easter cross. As his eagle, eagle project? project? And they t they rebuilt it at East Lawn Memorial. Oh, Your gardens. Gosh. So yeah. at nine o'clock, which is the hour according to Mark, Matthew, and Luke that Jesus was crucified, we go and at the Easter cross, we read the accounts of the crucifixion and we sing some sacrament hymns you know upon the oh cross of calvary gosh. have a prayer you're gonna have company where this is, year where is the cross <laughs> nine o'clock so it's on the west end so you go to the very west yeah. end and you have to go down a little you'll okay. see it though. okay oh, wow oh and then we go to saint mary's for a good friday service and wow. then sam's favorite restaurant's always been chili so we break our fast at three o'clock <laughs> and have chilies right but, but you know you have something <laughs> festive yes. yeah. and then that, you know, yeah. it's kind of like Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar, right? I'm mean, so yep. if you're gonna do a lot of serious stuff, particularly with kids, you've got to have some food and some fun things. Yeah. Yes. You know, we bake hot cross buns, you know, and that's yeah. kind of yeah. fun to do. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I'm talking about all these things we do, like going to the temple and stuff. You're like, well, what about school? Well, I yeah. pull my kids out of school on Good <laughs> Friday, awesome. right? Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, pretty, yeah. <laughs> would you send your kids to school on Christmas Eve? That's a good point. <laughs> to me, Good yeah. Friday has a relationship to Easter that Christmas Eve has Christmas That's Day. That's really cool. Wow. I remember the one of the first times I did this when Rachel was just starting Timview High School. The attendant secretary called and said, you know, Rachel's not in school today. I said, I know. I kept her home. Oh, is she sick? I said, no. She goes, well, why'd you keep her home? I said, it's a holiday. What holiday is it? It's Good Friday. And she stopped. And she goes, what are you? And I said, Christian. <laughs> so anyway, There's um, a script. All right. you know, you your whole life for that. But you know, thing. I think we talked about this when we were talking about Christmas and Advent yeah. traditions. I have no problem with Easter bunnies and candy yeah. and dyeing the eggs. And I have no problem doing with it on Sunday. We get up and read the resurrection story from one of the gospels. We sing, mm -hmm. he is risen. We have family prayer. Then we go get the candy. Yeah. That's fine. And we say, you know, this candy is helping us be happy because this is such a joyous day. Oh, right? I love it. So, you know, it's just like I would never dispense with when children and grandchildren are young, some of the traditional mythological, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Batman in red suit kind of things on Christmas, even if yeah. it falls on a Sunday. But, you know, our family always lights our advent candles and has family prayer and we welcome the baby Jesus before we go down. Do you really? Well, that, that's commitment. I, so, that's so, but, so that's, that's my good. point is particularly when your children are younger, do the fun things with yeah. abandon. And that's why I don't care if Easter yeah. gets more commercialized, as long as you're able to harness that yeah. as part yeah. of your family celebration. Can Another, I ask? Well, sorry. I was going to say one more tradition that you have mentioned somewhere that I loved is that you talk about planting early blooming flowers. Oh, yeah. That is a really, that is a ritual for me that I don't think I realized until you said it, because it is part of Daffodils, tulips, and yeah. Yeah. It feels like it's time for the ones that will Easter. come up in time. Easter. Now, this year, Easter's early. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't look like they're all going to be up in time. So We're I just happily tulips went to really Smith's and Cook's really Nursery and bought a whole bunch more. <laughs> That we're already <laughs> supplanted because I've got to have some yeah. blooming flowers. And, you know, we decorate our living room. Yeah. So we have, um, you know, we have this wonderful Fontanini Christmas crash. crash. Yeah. But I found out that they had a Palm Sunday, Jesus on a donkey with children with palm branches. <laughs> and they had a garden tomb. And I even got a crucifixion is part okay. but so now we have in our living room, we have, there's actually a, um, a Utah-based group called Easter Crash, I think. And really? in addition to uh, doing a garden tomb thing, they have a Gethsemane where Jesus is kneeling on the rock and they have an olive tree. So we have on one table, Jesus in front of the olive tree. On top of our piano, we have this wonderful olive wood last supper scene I got in Bethlehem. Oh. And then we have, um, we've got some little like toll painting wood things. One's kind of a silhouette of a cru crucifixion and one is a silhouette of a of a empty tomb scene and those are on either side of the entertainment center and then we have the palm sunday thing on the dining room table and oh. we'll have the easter crush there and then we just put flowers all over okay. the living room so I that the it. couple weeks before easter it's like your your house was decorated for yeah. christmas yeah. and i start to adjust the music i listen to in the two weeks before easter mm -hmm. and i have a different playlist for every day of holy week
It's like really? triumphal Jesus is king kind of stuff. And it's not all Mormon Tabernacle Choir or Tabernacle Choir. No. Yeah. We dropped the Mormon. But anyway, when I started, it was Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I mean, I, I like Christian rock. There's a great group called Maranthem that has some wonderful oh, things. You yeah. know? And, and so I have Christ is King playlist we do on Palm Sunday. And then I have something for Monday, Thursday, something for Good Friday. I have all of this like, people can find too. Oh, You've it's shared. all in the appendix yeah. of Greater yeah. Love Hath yeah. No Man, a Latter day Saint guide to celebrate the Easter mm. season. I've made those suggestions yeah. available for people. Have you heard of a have you heard of a interdenominational Christian rock band? It's based here in Utah called The King Will Come. No, they but it are sounds so great. good. Okay. Uh, they have a song called Yet. And in the chorus, one of the main lines is Don't give up, don't give up on me yet. I think this could be like a holy Saturday. Okay. Oh, because totally, it's yeah. like that's the time where you're waiting for something to happen. Right. And, you know, right. and I'm so glad, even though I would have loved to have talked about all of Holy Week, Holy yeah. Saturday is one we don't usually talk about. Yeah. And yeah. Latter-day Saints in particular have some yeah. things we can do that make that significant. Yeah. That liminal waiting, Jesus in yeah. the spirit exactly. world. That's what temple work's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I just, you know, I just think that we prepare ourselves not just spiritually, but also mentally and emotionally yeah. as yeah. families. And, and once again, we have an apostolic mandate there. Elder Stevenson said we really, and yeah. I think we'll be surprised. I've already started to notice on some of the church leaders' social media accounts, they're starting to post videos oh, good. about yeah. different aspects. Cool. Elder Karen, of course, I'm going to have a favorite apostle. You know. <laughs> I'll be just glad Karen. we have Elder Karen, right? <laughs> yeah. He just did a beautiful one on redemption. And I suspect, I don't know this officially, uh -huh. but I suspect we'll see a lot in the week before Easter. Yeah. And so. so, you know, I've tried to assemble, and Trevin and I tried to assemble a lot of kind of scriptural and historical and traditional resources but I think the church and its leaders are going to be giving us all kinds of additional spiritual yeah. resources. So can I ask a question? This is totally logistical and out of my own ignorance, but how do we know about or why Easter falls where it does in the annual <laughs> calendar? And I guess in the weekly calendar, we do know that the crucifixion was the day before the Sabbath, right? And, the and that's the day after. Um, so uh, in the introduction of our book, we, we address the issue of how Easter is calculated. And okay. it's based totally on new moon and vernal equinox. And okay. the Western church did it different than the Eastern okay. church. So that's something that was decided by about the time of Constantine. Mm. In okay. terms of the Holy Week, and I've got a colleague, Jeff Chadwick, who's done a lot of work on this, and he'd back last supper all the way up to Tuesday. And he's there are a lot of different ways of calculating it. In our book, we chose to go with the traditional dates because... You know, a lot of Latter-day Saints suspect that Jesus was born in the spring. And, and because of the way people used to read yeah. Doctrine and Covenants 20, people used to settle on April 6th. But we still celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Right. There's some real utility yeah. in commemorating these events when at least the Western Christian world is, mm -hmm. is doing it, right? Totally. Uh, for me, one of the things I love about Christmas and Easter, besides the fact it is the birth of Jesus and the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is that these are two times when despite theological differences, we're able to come together with so much of the Christian world. And I'm really invested in interfaith. And it's a way we can find some common ground. So we use the traditional days, um, Palm Sunday being a week before Easter, Last Supper being a Thursday, crucifixion being on Friday. But the only day the scriptures are clear about is that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Okay. Now it does say at the end of Mark and Luke that when he was crucified, the Sabbath drew on, which is why traditionally it was put on a Friday because the Jewish mm. Sabbath is Friday evening, I Saturday see. evening. But in addition to the weekly Sabbath, according to Mosaic law, there are also what are called festal Sabbaths. Oh. And some of the holidays like Yom Kippur and Pesach or Passover, etc. So it could have been referring to another. Type so, of for Sabbath. instance, if Passover began at sunset on Thursday, the way Mark, Matthew, and Luke's present it, right? then Friday was a festal Sabbath. Oh, oh wow. Okay. okay, and then the weekly Sabbath would be Saturday. So it's complicated. And for those who are biblical studies nerds, I'm looking at you because I love you. <laughs> um, we have a whole appendix, appendix okay, B, cool. which is on right. chronology. And I give you every single possibility, but yeah. then come back to why we, for devotional purposes, went with the tradition. Yeah. Cool. There, Zach Davis did this interview with uh, a, a guy named Casper Turkile months ago who wrote a book called The Power of Ritual. And he talks about how how meaningful it can be to have a even if even if you are coming from a secular point of view, having a following the liturgical calendar is a way to is is powerful because it's cyclical and you yeah. come back to yeah. it every year that it's not about the particular date in in any sort of a linear way, but like every year you're going to come back to Lent and think about this year what you're adding and this year what you're taking away mm -hmm. or 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 whatever. And so I I think this is a 
this feels like there's so much potential that, to add well, to Well, you know, one of the other great kind of, it's not a fringe benefit, I think it's a direct benefit of celebrating liturgical events such as Christmas, Holy Week, Easter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even within the Latter-day Saint tradition, you know, Pioneer Day and Restoration of the yeah. Priesthood, is you can take those events that you use the occasion of the calendar and the seasons and then you take the meaning of that and apply it more frequently. So for instance, mm -hmm. why do Christians by and large, shout out to my Seventh-day Adventist friends, they do it differently, but mm -hmm. why most Christians celebrate the Christian Sabbath, I put that in air quotes, on Sundays because that's the Lord's Day. It's commemorating the resurrection. So mm -hmm. in other words, every Sunday should be Easter. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday should be Good Friday because we're commemorating the suffering death of Jesus with the sacrament every single week. Yeah. Christmas. Every day should be Christmas. Yeah. Um, a tradition in the Catholic and Anglican tradition is in morning prayer to always recite or sing the Magnificat, which is the Luke 1 passage, you know, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And the idea is just as Mary magnified the Lord by bringing forth Jesus literally, a Christian should pray each day, may I bring Jesus in the world this day through my faith, through my example, through my service. Right. So yeah. every day should be Christmas. We wow. should have the joy that Christ came to the world every day, and we should be bringing Christ to the world every day, and we should be commemorating his death and celebrating his resurrection every single Sunday. Yeah. I love that. I love so that. if we do this right at Holy Week and Easter, it will, I think, enliven and invigorate our weekly Sabbath. And, and, I, I, and I have noticed that I think it's hard sometimes to just go there mentally, like to have that feeling and you bring it back on Sundays, but having these very tangible kind of ritual things, like this is the candle that has this scent or the, or this particular flower that has this scent or this thing we're going to bake or the Easter crash, like all of those really tangible things, I think are tools to help you go there where it matters. So right? for instance, one of the most powerful things in, in restoration experience is temple worship where we are involved in hearing and seeing and feeling and experiencing on lots of different levels. And so the spirit can teach us more. And, and that's exactly what you're saying with how we choose to celebrate holidays. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's mean, and, it's heavy with meaning, not frivolous. That's so much. That can be the anchor that kind of gets you there. All right. So maybe we could get into sort of moving into the weekend. Sure. The, some of these, some of the specifics around these four days. And I personally would love to hear if you can correlate as you're talking about, you know, tradition and ritual, maybe what happened specifically just as a refresher sure, during the life sure. of Jesus on each of these. Okay. Four. So even though we're not talking about Palm Sunday and what happened Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I want to frame the entire observance or commemoration or celebration of Holy Week, however you want to term that, however you're comfortable terming sure. that, mm -hmm. um, in terms of it being a journey with Jesus. Um, in our book, we suggest in the introduction that we were inviting people to take a scriptural journey with Jesus mm -hmm. through his last days. Now, the model for that is what has been done since at least the fourth century in Jerusalem in the Holy Land. We know that after Constantine made Christianity a legal religion, in fact, favored it and let his mother build churches, etc., that the Holy Land became a center for pilgrimage. And we have accounts of some of these pilgrims and what they experienced when they came to these sacred sites. And one in particular I like, I call her Agaria, because that's how it's in Latin, but I think usually people say Agaria. She's a nun from Spain who okay. traveled all the way to the Holy Land and wrote in great detail every place she went and everything she saw and did. And she mentioned that in the week before Easter, the Christians would go to the different places where Jesus taught, worked a miracle like raising Lazarus from the tomb, where he celebrated the Last Supper, you know, where he was crucified, and they would read the scriptures and sing and pray and commemorate that. Mm -hmm. And so apparently this was a very powerful, well, not apparently, because it still is for Christians who go to the Holy Land now. It's a powerful experience because you have sacred time. Mm -hmm. You're commemorating events in the sequence, more or less when we think they happened. And it's converging with sacred space. Okay. Yeah. So you are commemorating these events in holy places at sacred times. That's really yeah. cool. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is why we took our BYU Jerusalem students down the Mount of Olives last April, and we were joined by 3,000 other Christians. About half were local Palestinian Christians, but half were pilgrims who came from all over. And they were commemorating what Jesus did on that triumphal entry. And it's really powerful. But, you know, most people can't go to the Holy Land. 
Yeah. And if you can't go to the Holy Land, you usually don't go at Easter Christmas because it's just crazy mm -hmm. and expensive <laughs> and hard to find reservations. But we can all do a scriptural journey through those events. And so the idea is, and, and this is the way my work on this has been set up since I was a young bishop back in 1996 when I started doing <laughs> this. Um, and, and in my first books and now this revision expansion. The idea was let's anchor it in the scriptures. You know, Latter-day Saints have different flavors. Some are going to be more comfortable with traditions than others. Mm. Some, but everyone's comfortable reading the scriptures and praying. <laughs> and they're usually comfortable reading, singing, particularly if they're hymns, right? So at the very base, let's talk about the scriptural episodes. Let's read them with their families. Let's talk about them. Sing perhaps a hymn or another song that goes with that event. And then have family prayer, the very least. But the more I've done this in my own spiritual practice is I've really tried to make, okay, I'm going to try not to get too personal here. You know, I have for a long time found that my worst prayers were my public prayers because I was more cognizant <laughs> of people listening to me and do I sound good? Yeah, I Am I phrasing that. this well, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. But then something shifted because I remember once praying for sacrament meeting and I was just conscious I was supposed to be representing every person in that room. And I've been an ordinance worker in the Prolo Temple, now the Orem Temple, for 19 years. And those opportunities I have to lead a prayer circle, I mean, doing this very sacred thing with people who are all focused. Now those kind of prayers are actually my most powerful ones because I feel mm -hmm. the faith of the people I'm praying for. And, you know, I, 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 so anyway, I've, I've been mm -hmm. trying to now take that intensity into my personal prayer life. And so I'm spending a lot of time reading Psalms and listening to music before I do my personal prayers. I'm trying to pray out loud so it doesn't become, you know, just thoughts in my head in bed, bouncing off the ceiling, not making it to God. <laughs> um, in my book on worship, I have a whole chapter on prayer where I kind of explore some of these things. But recently, I have been exposed to a tradition called imaginative prayer. And it was actually on the Hallow app, which Jonathan Rumi, if you know, he's oh, the yeah. Jesus oh. from The Chosen. He and yeah. Mark Wahlberg and this Father Mike and some other people are doing it mostly for Catholics. Yeah. It was a Lenten thing. Yeah. But they have this sister, Sister Miriam, who on Wednesdays leads people through imaginative prayer where she talks her listeners through an experience like Gar Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And imagine what the leaves felt like as he knelt down and the sound of the breaking twigs and the sound of the crickets and the sight of the moon and the smells and just try to put yourself in that position. Mm -hmm. Well, I did some digging and found out that imaginative prayer, as it is popularly practiced by some of our Christian cousins, actually has its roots in something called imaginative con contemplation. Yeah. Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuit order, yeah. said, you know, what you need to do is read scripture and pray as if you were there and allow the spirit to guide you through it. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is now I'm trying to be even more intentional than I have for 20 or 30 years as I'm taking the scriptural journey with Jesus to really put myself there. And not just when I'm reading with my family and praying with my family, but in my own personal prayers mm -hmm. to spend some time just imagining being with Jesus and joy on Palm Sunday and tenderness as the woman anoints him on Wednesday and mix of sadness and, and, and hope for his disciples at the Last Supper and what he felt in Gethsemane, what he felt on the cross, what he felt when he went to the spirit world, right, while his body was in the tomb, what it felt like for the women and then Mary and then Peter and John and the disciples to see Jesus. In fact, if you don't mind, I'm just going to just yeah, read this yeah, from yeah. St. Ignatius. This was in a book he wrote called Spiritual Exercises. Okay. Imagining Christ our Lord before me on the cross, asking how it came about that the Creator made himself man and from eternal life came to temporal death and thus to die for my sins. Then turning to myself, I shall ask, what have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What ought I do for Christ? Mm -hmm. it just, it's just so powerful to me. I mean, one of the things I've been really trying to do in my personal practice um, and I explored, explored this in my Deseret book on worship, is this idea of kavanah or intentionality. Kavanah is a Hebrew term which means to direct. Mm -hmm. That when you're praying or singing praises or performing rituals, are you doing it as if you were right before God? And so I just think that this scriptural journey that we're going to take through Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday, if we have any time left after being happy, <laughs> What I hope that I will be able to do, and perhaps some of your listeners and viewers will be interested in doing, is not just read the scriptures, not just talk about them, 
but send some time. Uh, there's this great tradition called Lectio Divina or Divine. Oh, we love yeah, this. Reading, yeah. Where you read it, you think about it, you pray about it, and then you contemplate. Now, contemplate is different than think. Yep. So it's, it's oratio, it's lectio, oratio, um, I'm getting meditatio, meditatio and then contemplatio. contemplatio. Yeah. But that last part is when you just sit and let mm -hmm. the spirit transform you. And so I just hope that I can not only imagine being with Jesus. And there's some great examples. A couple of our Latter-day Apostles have had experiences where they saw Christ in Gethsemane, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, so, so I mean, there's actually yeah. license for this. I mean, none of us are apostles, but I think at some level, the spirit can take us to those places. But then the next question, it's kind of like I, I mentioned the Magnificat in the morning is not just, well, Mary, magnify the Lord. How can I magnify the Lord of the day? Is what St. Ignatius said next, after we have these different experiences with Jesus as we're doing the scriptural journey, we always have to say, what's next, right? He says at the Last Supper in the Johannine account, if you love me, keep my commandments. But if he would sacrifice everything for us, what will we sacrifice for others, right? Yeah. That's really beautiful. Thank you. So is the prayer to you, is the prayer part of that experience, the contemplation where you're kind of in a, more in alignment with the story and the word, or is it about, yeah, this, you know, what I am think I being one of the today? challenges that many of us have in our personal prayer life is it's, it's just too much about the middle. Yeah. Why right? we open the name of the father, we do stuff, we close the name of the son and we're done. We don't always lay the groundwork. We don't prepare ourselves, which would be for me reading the scriptures and thinking mm -hmm. about the event and then thanking the Lord for it, asking the Lord to help me appreciate it more. And then pause, even mm -hmm. before you close your prayer and let the Spirit kind of lead you through that. And then ask the question, how can I be more like the Savior in this? You know. Yeah. So I, I think we need to have more pauses in our personal prayers. And then when you say amen, don't get off your knees. Have the time for contemplatio. Love that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I, I'm excited about that. I love it because it kind of is an exercise of just the pause. Like here's a, here's a way to actively pause. Well, and you know, yeah. the reality is, I mean, and I guess I'm an academic or scholar at some level, but you know, I, I listen to some of my colleagues and I, I listen to Kara's wonderful thing about, you know, the aloneness and how, yeah. it, and I thought, wow, he's just such a great <laughs> doctrinaire guy. And so many people are good theologians. And, and I don't know that I'm any of those things. If people ask me how to describe myself. I say, well, in my work, I'm an exegete. I do, I deal with text, but really what I am is a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I can't really feel, I can't be a theologian like some people at the Maxwell Institute. And I may not be as good a doctrinal teacher as Tony Sweat and Gary Mulestein and some <laughs> others, but I try real hard to live by religion. And I try real hard to teach it to my children and to enjoy it with my wife and share it with my friends. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's the little thing I have to add is just yeah. really talk about living our religion. It's really yeah. beautiful. I'll let other people who are good at the doctrine, <laughs> right, do that part. Um, but I would just like to share what I have experienced. And I'm a little for clamped at Yiddish word, maybe I'm a little emotional here, but because that's what it is to me. Yeah. That's what it is to me is Jesus being real in my life yeah yeah, yeah. that idea thank of, you so not, much I, mean, I think a lot of us can relate to not being theologians but we can all aspire to be practitioners right it's really relatable i love that yeah. you shared that should yeah, we get into Monty let's, let's do it let's do it okay, okay. what is this word monty by the way <laughs> now it's should only we... in the english tradition because okay. a lot of your class catholic friends would just call it holy thursday okay okay but in england they took the latin term mandatum which is for commandment mm -hmm. a new commandment i give you mandatum novum and it kind of cool okay. changed in english to Monday. so okay. Monday thursday is the commandment thursday cool but it's commemorating the commandment we have to love each other once again jesus loved us so much he instituted the second of the lord's supper he watched his disciples feet he suffered in the garden okay now what will we do to love as he loved okay will we commemorate his sacrifice each week with the eucharist communion or sacrament will we serve each other as he washed his disciples feet you know will we be willing to bear their burdens as he did for us in gethsemane so that's what the term means and this is a some some traditions they do have these rituals still of washing feet right more than not actually oh, really okay. now when i talk about liturgical churches i mean orthodox roman catholic Anglican, so Episcopalian in this country, some Lutheran and Methodist. Okay. Although a lot of evangelical Christians are trying to pick up on this. Now, traditionally, Protestants got rid of a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff, right? But I think a lot of evangelical Christians trying to connect with Jesus are picking that up. And yeah. so they will have not only a celebration of Eucharist communion, or what we would call the Second Lord's Supper, they will have a foot washing. So in oh. Jerusalem, 
last time I did this went to Notre Dame of Jerusalem, they pulled 12 people out of the audience and the patriarch of Jerusalem washed their feet. Wow. So the Pope will do that in Rome. And the idea is you take your leader. In England, the king or queen of England didn't wash people's feet, but they gave money to the poor on Monday, Thursday. So the idea is he who will be first among you, whether it be a church leader or a political leader, mm -hmm. will serve the least. So yeah. th that's what those kind of cool. customs are. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So, you know, would it be great to go to a soup kitchen on Monday, Thursday? Yeah. And take yeah. your kids to the bishop's storehouse or do some kind of service, right? Yeah. yeah. And I love the idea of a Last Supper. Like that, that that's meal. the way to get a kid's attention. Yeah. Have a real meal where you can talk. But about have the meal supper. be different. Yeah. I mean, that's where Jewish friends do. They say, why are we eating unleavened bread? Why are we eating better herbs? So mm -hmm. you make kind of a Mediterranean style thing. You don't try to reenact it at the Passover yeah. state necessarily. But your kids are saying, well, why are we eating this kind of food? Yeah. Well, this is the kind of food Jesus was having with his friends and family the day. last night of his life. Yeah. That's okay. beautiful. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to go to... Do you want, is there anything else you want to say about Monday, Thursday? I mean, there's yes, a lot I, that happened in Jesus' so life much. beyond just, you know, the Last Supper. Right. On this Thursday. And, and you know, it's not that other Christians don't think Gethsemane was significant. Yeah. Uh, in fact, for our, our Catholic friends, they have what they call the five sorrowful mysteries of their rosary. And mm -hmm. one of them is suffering in the garden. But you throw in Messiah 3 and Doctrine and Covenants 19 mm -hmm. yep. and our understanding of the atoning process, right? Now, there was a time in our, in our community, mid-50s, through about the 80s, when I think we emphasize Gethsemane over the cross. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now the pendulum, I think, has come back where we talk about both. Yeah. It's because it I begins right. at Gethsemane and it culminates on the cross, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the way I describe it is the weight of our sins, our sorrows, our disappointments, our afflictions were put on Christ in the garden. Gethsemane means place of the olive press. And the pressure of that caused him to suffer and to bleed yeah. from every pore. But it, it's not that he suffered for our sins End of story in Gethsemane, he carried that burden to the cross where he died for them. But because of our additional doctrinal insights into that, I've always been kind of perplexed that we don't do more on Monday Thursday. Yeah. Mm. Um, early on, uh, before I had started writing books on this or blogging on this, my wife and I would just read the account of the Last Supper and would read Luke 22 about Gethsemane, and we'd share our testimonies to each other of the atonement. And what it meant to us, what Christ had done for us. So I, I would not let a Holy Thursday go by yeah. without sharing my testimony of what Christ started in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And then there are some other things that are hard and at different points in your life. I don't know if I do this with children, but Judas's betrayal, mm -hmm. um, Jesus's abandonment by the other disciples, which is kind of passive betrayal. Mm -hmm. Jesus's abuse at the hands of Jewish guards that night, Roman guards the next morning, the false, you know, judgment that passed on him, Peter denying knowing Jesus. Those are things we've all experienced. Yeah. And you know, no one who has been betrayed by a spouse or beat up by his buddies or left in the lurch by your friends can say Jesus doesn't know what that's about. So depending upon where you are in life and where your family is, I would probably, in addition to commemorating the Last Supper and what we call the sacrament and talking about the Gethsemane experience, I would talk about those hard things and say, Jesus has descended below these all. You know, as Carrie was talking in your interview about yeah. the separation, well, these are things that separate us from each other and our loved ones and from God, these horrible experiences in life, and Jesus experienced them for us. Yeah. Where where does Jesus pass the night and sort of the early morning hours? So it's interesting, uh, right? if I can go back to the Holy Land for a moment, you know, there is a, a, a service in the Church of All Nations or the Basilica of the Agonies. It's also called In Gethsemane. And they then have a candlelight walk from there through the Kidron Valley to a church called St. Peter in Galakantu, which is St. Peter the Cockcrow. It's one of the two places uh -huh. that claims to be where Caiaphas's palace was. Okay. So where Jesus was interviewed by the Jewish leaders, where he was kept for the night, where he was abused by the guards, and where Peter denied knowing him, which yeah. is why it's called Peter yeah. the Cockcrow. Yeah. And in fact, what we did last year is we had our own Gethsemane devotional, Last Supper and Gethsemane devotional at the Jerusalem Center. Then we walked down to Gethsemane and joined all those worshipers that came out of their church. And we had a candlelight walk together yeah. with them to St. Peter's. So wow. we know somewhere on the south end of Jerusalem is where he was kept okay. for the night. And then the next morning as we move into Good Friday is when he was delivered to Pilate. Okay, and Pilate's judgment happens that morning and right, yeah, the, right away we move the, on to Once again, John and the synoptics are a little different, right? Yeah. So Mark has Jesus crucified by nine. 
the third hour. hour. Yeah, the yeah. third hour. So it's early, which means he had to be tried. And Luke has him also yeah. going to Herod Anipus and back and forth. So a lot has to happen early. John doesn't have that happen till he's not crucified till 12. Yeah. So the Johannine when you say crucified, are you saying gets on the cross? Yeah, he's okay. on the cross he's at the 12, cross. whereas Mark, followed by Matthew, okay. Luke has him on the cross at nine. So there are theological reasons why those accounts differ. And by the way, we don't have time to go into this, but it's in the book if people are interested. John does not portray the Last Supper as a Passover meal. That's a big deal. Mm. Because the Mark, Matthew, and Luke are explicit that he was celebrating Passover. But in John, it's just his last supper. Because in John, Passover begins in the evening after Christ dies. Hmm. So according to Josephus, the Passover lambs, it was like an assembly line. They were all being slaughtered in the temple between 12 and 3 in the afternoon before Passover began at sunset. And so the way John portrays it, Jesus is nailed to the cross as the first lamb has its throat cut. And he dies on the cross as the last lamb has its throat cut. Mm. So the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist calls him in John 1, is actually dying as the Paschal lambs that year are being ritually sacrificed. Oh. So, so there's a difference, and it's for theological reasons. And there are a number of places your listeners can, can go for that. But, but there are a number of reasons. But So anyway, at, if you go with Mark's account, he's, he's nailed the cross at 9. At noon, there's the darkness, and at 3, he dies. Okay. In John, he's crucified at 12, and we presume he dies at 3. So it's shorter for theological reasons. Okay. And I've heard you mention this before, but tell us why good, why it's called Good Friday. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was a young child growing up in Pittsburgh <laughs> where all my friends were Catholic. We had fish on Friday, and we didn't have school on Good Friday. Maybe that's yeah. where I got the idea. I always said to mom, I said, Mom, what's so good about it? Jesus <laughs> my son died. asked me this like 24 yeah. hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... At first blush, you could say it's good because he accomplished the atonement for us yeah. and God reconciled the world to himself through the death of his only beloved son. But probably linguistically what we have happening here is good. is like goodbye literally originally meant go with God. Right. So it was actually God's Friday, Good okay. Friday. Okay. So okay. it was the day when God redeemed us through yeah. Jesus. Any other, I don't know, rituals or traditions you well, would like to mention? I've mentioned, mentioned in passing, you yeah. know, our... Um, our family always reads the accounts of, of Pilate's judgment of Jesus and the crucifixion, usually from Mark and John. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more recently, we've started doing it at the Easter Cross here in Provo. Mm -hmm. When my children were younger, when we did baptisms for the dead, we would do it on that day because I got them out of school and that was one day the baptistry wasn't full <laughs> was when yeah. most mm -hmm. kids were at school. But, you know, my thought was, you know, get them close to the Lord. And also, I knew I wanted to do St. Mary's and I never wanted to do other people's churches if I haven't done my own first, if that makes any sense. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now we've shifted our temple attendance more to Saturday for reasons we'll talk about yeah. in a moment. Okay. And the endowment for me has some symbolism that's really significant when it comes to crucifixion. So that's why I started mm -hmm. doing that on Good Friday, but now I'm thinking more about work for the dead and yeah. that's why I do it then. Um, but I, I think you want to at least early on in the day read the account of the trial and the judgment and the crucifixion. Great hymn. It's an old ba Bach tune. Um, but uh, a Latter-day Saint hymn writer, whose name will come back to me in a moment, she um, wrote words to make it both an Easter hymn and a sacred hymn. Um, o Savior, Thou Who Wearest a Crown. Mm. It's oh, a yeah. great one to sing because it talks about him being cruelly beaten and whipped mm. and wearing the crown of thrones and then being taken to the cross. Um, we like to sing Upon the Cross of Calvary or Jesus of Nazareth. Um, just to be kind of solemn. So we, I have a Good Friday playlist, which is pretty mm -hmm. solemn. Yeah. Recently, I've started playing a lot of Arabic Christian music because they've got some really, really poignant tunes. Yeah. Uh, Firuz is this wonderful Arabic uh, female singer, and she's got some Eastern Christian Good Friday hymns. Wow. Because that kind of makes it feel like you're back at the time. Yeah. But, you know, Tadmark yeah. Choir's got some great stuff. Christian groups have great stuff. So we play different music. We we do like to make hot cross buns if I can get all the stuff together. I love it. Um, anyway. Okay. okay. That's great. Yeah. So many ideas. Thank you. Okay. So Holy Saturday, is that what you would call yeah, it? Yeah, that's Holy what Saturday? I think most name? liturgical Christians call it. Most people okay. just call it the Saturday before Easter, I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> Protestants and Latter-day Saints wouldn't call it anything else. <laughs> now, traditionally... The resurrection was actually celebrated Saturday night. Oh, really? Mm. Now, the early Christians kind of followed the Jewish practice of a day began at sunset, right? Oh, okay. And, start, and so the resurrection you can do is early, and they usually do it about midnight. So you'll have yeah. some Christian churches will have what they call an Easter vigil where they will go and they will sing and they will pray and they're waiting for the moment yeah. they can say, 
uh, you know, yeah. Christus Anesti, Christ is risen, hallelujah, you know, he's mm -hmm. risen indeed. And a lot of times they will light the Paschal candle, which is the white Easter candle, and some will then pass the light. There's a great ceremony the Eastern Orthodox and Armenians do at the Church of Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem called, it's called the Holy Fire. Mm -hmm. And by tradition, the Greek Orthodox patriarch goes into the tomb of Christ without anything, and he comes out with fire. And then mm -hmm. the Armenian patriarch takes it and the whole church is full of candles. And then the, the roads outside the Holy Sepulchre are just jammed with people and they pass the fire wow. person to person. You just, it actually feels warm as the heat waves up. Oh. And it's the idea of the light has come back, right? But that gets to the point of this in-between time between the death and the burial Friday evening, if we're using the mm -hmm. traditional calendar, and that Easter vigil Saturday night, or for us, Easter morning sunrise services are more popular with Protestants. And of course, we'll yeah. do sacrament meeting Sunday morning. But there's this in-between state. The technical term for this is a liminal time. Mm -hmm. um, Lehman is the word for, Latin and Greek term for a, like a door frame or a mm -hmm. threshold. I didn't know where that came from. So a liminal yeah. experience is a crossing, a threshold or boundary or different kinds from one state mm -hmm. to another. So we're in this in-between time. And this has come to mean a lot more to me as I've lost people I love. First my father, then my mother. Um, one of the hardest times, I mean, Latter-day Saint funerals by and large are good. We have, we could do some things a little bit better, but <laughs> the hardest time for me is between the death and the funeral, mm -hmm. right? The funeral, you're celebrating the life and there's plan of salvation and there's music and people are there to support you. The hardest time were those days between my mom died on Monday and the funeral was Saturday mm -hmm. and I just had some dark times in there. And so what I always try to do, and I'm going to try it more now with this imaginative prayer approach, yeah. is what was it like for the mother of Jesus, for Mary Magdalene, for the disciples? They had lost their son, their best friend, their master, their teacher, and they still had put it all together, what Jesus mm -hmm. had prophesied about coming back. And, you know, there are, I don't want to get political here, but there are some, some of our friends, even in our community, who find themselves in marginalized groups. They live with liminality, mm. <laughs> yeah. you know. So there's there's a time um, that we can maybe empathize with them wow. a little That's bit really, more, right? Really beautiful, yeah. Right about what does it we mean to yeah. to be in between? Wow. The joy is Easter comes, right? As I have been saying, and I've done a number of interviews and, and activities this season. I'm saying you can appreciate more the miracle of the resurrection when you better understand the price of the sex. And so I think Latter-day Saints doctrinally can do a lot with Gethsemane and Calvary. I think we can do more with Good Friday as a whole. I mean, that one day a year, maybe we don't use crosses by tradition as much as other Christians do, but that one day a year, you can have some pictures of the crucifixion up. My wife will let me put my fonts in any <laughs> crucifixion up for that day. <laughs> sit with the grief yeah. and then sit with the in-betweenness with the uncertainty, the sadness, the separation. You know, one of the hardest things uh, that I heard again and again when my dad and especially my mom died, people were like, oh, but you're gonna see her again. 30 years from now, right? I mean, what mom doesn't cry when her kid goes on a mission? Yeah. Not seeing her for 18 months or him for 24 months. And heaven forbid that Elaine dies before me, it's not gonna be a lot of comfort if I have to live 15 or 20 years without her. And that's what Holy Saturday can teach us. Just mm -hmm. a day and a half, two days, three days, depending upon what chronology you mm -hmm. use, yeah. of being without Jesus was hard. And sometimes you have to sit with the grief. That's what mindfulness teaches us for those who practice meditation and mindfulness, is you have to acknowledge the feeling. Yeah. doesn't mean you wallow in it. But sometimes the more we try to white knuckle it, the more it kind of is intrusive, if that makes any totally. sense. Totally, yeah. And, and I'm not a meditation expert, but but I think you probably yeah. are familiar with some things. Yeah. So I think Holy Saturday, oh, and I'm sorry, I almost got away from this. There's a tradition that Jesus went and broke Adam and Eve out of jail. He busted down the gates <laughs> of hell and pulled Adam and Eve out. And we actually know that's true. Section 138, <laughs> a vision of Joseph F. Smith said he went and got Adam and Eve and the righteous, who even though they weren't in quote unquote hell, they were in a place in the spirit prison. They saw their separation from their bodies as bondage and they were waiting. And mm. Jesus came and said, here I am. And they rejoiced. Mm. So we always read section 138 mm. as a family and talk about it. And now 
my temple practices shift a little more from Good Friday to yeah. Saturday because Christ went the spirit world to organize the preaching of his gospel to those who didn't hear it. We can take part in his work by going and performing some of those vicarious ordinances for the people that are being preached to. Yeah, that's really interesting that that um, theologically that spirit world idea that we have is the most liminal part of the plan of salvation. Absolutely. And so Jesus is using his liminal space to sort of like minister in that right, liminal space. Right, right. So Very let's not forget Holy Saturday. And it yeah. is holy. Yeah. These are holy things we've been talking about. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. I listen Thank to you. Uh, Kundix Redeemer and Mac Wilberg's Requiem on that day. These are two great Latter-day Saint composers and mm. rangers. And because Holy Saturday for me has such a strong restoration feel because yeah. of Section 138 and Temple work, I listen to Messiah, you know, different parts of it on the different days. And I listen to Matthew's Passion and John's Passion. But on Saturday, I listen to beautiful Latter-day Saint music. That's mm. my Aww. tradition. Cool. Yeah, That's my tradition. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that brings us to Easter Sunday. We made we it. Did it. Okay, I'll tell you, there's <laughs> something I wish we could do. And mm -hmm. I've done it sometimes during warm ups with the Tabernacle Choir. And I've done it with my Jerusalem Center students. And I think I probably even did it in Sac in Jerusalem, but I would not impose this <laughs> upon my Bishop or Stake president because they'd be uncomfortable with it. But do you know the traditional greeting when you see someone Easter morning is, Alleluia, Christ is risen. And the response is, <laughs> He's risen indeed, hallelujah. And so wow. I trained wow. my students. I said, I'm going to say this, and this is your response. And I would, we did it in the garden tomb. We went for oh, an wow. Easter service, the garden tomb. And I said, hallelujah, Christ is risen. They said, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. Now let me tell you about hallelujah. Hallelujah is a great liturgical formula from the Hebrew Bible. A lot of the Psalms begin and end with praise the Lord in mm -hmm. English. It's actually hallelujah, which means oh, okay. praise be Yah, which is short for Jehovah. Okay. Okay. So you're praising Jehovah, Jesus yeah. Christ, is Jehovah wow. made flesh. Okay. Now here's yeah, a tradition, that. and I've had a hard time getting some of my Latter-day Saint musician friends to understand this. The tradition <laughs> in traditional Christianity is to not say hallelujah between Ash Wednesday and Easter morning. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And you know, people are like, I want to sing the hallelujah chorus <laughs> and we're going to do it on Good Friday. like, don't do it because <laughs> if you're trying to reach out to the wow. Christians, you're going to think you're yeah. ignorant. But the reason is, is it's a solemn preparatory period and it makes shouting or singing Alleluia Easter morning all the great yeah. because you haven't done it for 46 days. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So it's a part of their liturgy during most prayer services and, and worship yeah. services, except from Ash Wednesday to Saturday evening. And then you say it. Now, I'm not going to do that in our word Easter program, <laughs> but our word primary after my talk is going to sing. Shauna Edwards has this great arrangement called Risen. It's beautiful. Mm. And one of the yeah. choruses is, you know, Hallelujah. And so I'm going to explain in my talk oh, why Hallelujah right. is so significant on Easter yeah. morning. And for us, with our understanding that that name title, which, you know, 96% of the time is referring to premortal Jesus Christ. Um, if you're wondering where I'm going with that, read section 109. But anyway, um, it's a name title, so it can be applied to the Father. But it's almost okay. always, as we know, the premortal Jesus Christ. He became the man Jesus. He suffered and died. But when he rose in glory, he's reclaiming that deity that he set aside at his condescension. Wow. And so by shouting or singing Alleluia on Easter morning, we're saying not just he's risen, he's Jehovah again. Mm. Right? Yeah. He was the man Jesus for 30 years or so. He suffered and died for us. And now he's risen in glory. And a great thing to do, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, he says, be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. But what does he say? Is it 35, 12, 48? Um, where he says, be ye perfect as I or my Father in yeah. heaven because the risen Lord mm -hmm. is perfect and wow. he's glorified and he's Jehovah. And we can say hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So wow. we didn't do much with Easter, yeah. but we did yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> We did that. So find a way yeah, to yeah. say or sing hallelujah on yeah. Easter yeah. Sunday, knowing what that means. He's reclaimed his divine status and he's glorified more than ever because he's finished his work. Wow. Yeah. Maybe, wow, that's really powerful. Could we maybe end by, I, I guess I'd like to ask you personally, what practical effect this whole, um, this whole week, you know, that happened 2000 years ago has had and what atonement or as we've started pronouncing it at one minute, 
you know, really mean. Yeah, what and, really and this is this can be a whole other discussion because yeah. that one mint is a very useful thing to do in English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, Kippur in in Hebrew means to cover or to redeem. Yes. And Katalage, which means to reconcile. Yeah. Mm. Now, um, as I was listening to your interview with Carrie, this whole idea of bringing one together. Yeah. Katalage in Greek means taking things that have become other, alos, leading them together again, kata ago. Mm -hmm. So we are bringing katalage is you're taking things that are other and bringing them together. And where does this yeah. Greek word appear? 27 katalage. times in the New Testament. Okay. It appears, Atonement only appears once in your King and how James. How is it translated in so King usually James? Usually reconciliation. Reconciliation. Usually okay. reconciliation. Yeah. Right, we're separated, but atonement has become so important in Latter Day Saint theological discourse because it's so ubiquitous in the Book of Mormon. Right mm. now, I don't know what the Nephite word was there. Was it Kippur? Was it something like Katalage? But in Nephite, was it several different terms? All I know is that Joseph Smith rendered a term as atonement, which has this great semantic range. It doesn't just mean to cover up sins, which is what Kippur is probably meaning. It doesn't just mean to reconcile estranged parties, which is what katalage means, okay? It means everything Christ did to make us one with the Father. And as you discussed in that episode with Carrie, we are separated and we're being brought together as one, but there are lots of things that make us not like the Father, right? My God doesn't die, our mortality makes us not like the Father. My God doesn't sin, our sin makes us not like the father. My God's not autistic. And my son who lives with autism is not like God in that way. Because the atonement, this is one of the great Christological contributions of, Alma, of the Book of Mormon. Alma 7 says he, it's healing. Uh, Terrell and Fiona Givens have done a lot yeah. on this, right? The atonement's everything Jesus did to make us one and like the Father. And the two, when I used to teach Book of Mormon a lot more, I would always talk about the two grand pillars of the atonement, our redemption from sin and resurrection from death. Because spiritual and physical death are things that separate every one of us from God. But there are a lot of other things in our life that make us not like God. And so you've got this wonderful healing power of the atonement. But we're not strong like God is. I think of Elder Bednar's emphasis on the strength and enabling power of the atonement. And although I made an argument for the atoning process being Gethsemane to Calvary, in reality, it's garden, tomb, and ascension right? Mm. The atonement, the Book of Mormon sometimes uses it narrowly, atonement for sin, resurrection, as if they're two different things. But theologically, I think I'm not a theologian, but if I were a theologian, <laughs> I would say we can make a good argument. The atonement's everything Christ has done. Mm. Taking the burden, suffering for it, carrying it to the cross, dying for it. Uh, I, when I teach this, I sometimes use the sacrificial pro, um, practice in, in Leviticus 1. When you brought a sacrifice to the door of the tabernacle or to the temple, you bring the victim, you place your hands on it and say, this for me. The Levite or the priest would lead it to the altar, sacrifice it, burn it. The smoke would go up to God. Our, our burden was put on Christ, this for me. His, his betrayal, abandonment, arrest, mm -hmm. abuse was being led to the altar. The cross was the altar. And then rising with healing in his wings from the tomb and up to heaven is the smoke going. So you've got in Israelite sacrificial practice the full spectrum of the atonement. Okay. And, and this is why in our book, we didn't just add a prelude the week before Holy Week. We added that postlude because the story didn't end that day. He kept appearing. I mean, one of the earliest texts is 1 Corinthians 15 where he says, you know, he was seen first of Peter and then of James and then of the 12 and then the others and last of all me. But then he kept showing up. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you, third Nephi is actually a couple months after the resurrection. Right. And then you've got all the time shows of Smith saw him, and you've got witnesses of modern apostles and prophets and the Easter story continues. Yeah. So yeah, we emphasize it on Easter, but we shouldn't stop, you know, and actually in liturgical tradition, it's the first Sunday of Easter, but the next week's the second Sunday of Easter, then the third Sunday of Easter, and the fourth Sunday of Easter. And they continue oh, wow. to celebrate Easter until you get to Pentecost. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. You have Ascension Day and you have Pentecost. And so I don't think we should let it go. The joy we have that we're commemorating and what we're celebrating at Easter, we should carry with us. And as I've argued, every sacrament meeting should have an element of Good Friday and Easter in it. Mm. The sacrament hymn and the sacrament ordinance is Good Friday. 
and let's get a little bit more hallelujah in our sacrament yeah. talks, right? Yeah. Let's have a little bit more preaching about the living Christ, not just the one who suffered and died, the living Christ and how he's in our lives and how he can live in us and how we can bless other people and how we can bring that life to other people. I mean, the best talks are about how we live the gospel and bless other people. That's Christ in us, right? What does he say in Third Nephi? Hold up your light. Behold, I am the light which you shall hold up. When we have the living, risen Lord in our lives, how can it not change how we act and live every day? So that's my Easter message. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Thanks Thank so you. Thank you so me. much. I'm sorry if I went yeah. over today. No, but that was. I just wanted to get really every bit of that awesome. out. Yeah. And yeah. audience, have a solemn Good Friday <laughs> and a wonderful Happy Easter. And may Easter be every day, every Sunday from now on. All right, thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Eric Huntsman. You can find Eric's beautiful Easter book, God So Loved the World, on Amazon or a desert book in Barnes & Noble. And we want to make sure that you know about Faith Matters' newest podcast, Proclaim Peace. We're co-sponsoring this podcast with Mormon Women for Ethical Government, and it's hosted by Patrick Mason and Jennifer Walker Thomas. If you love the Faith Matters podcast, you're going to love this one too. Thanks again for listening, and remember you can check out more at faithmatters.org.